details. Get your pen and your notebooks. Let's go to school right now. Enjoy the study. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He didn't say they will not have unrighteousness. He didn't say they will not have sin. All he's saying here is I will be merciful. My attitude towards their sin and unrighteousness is mercy. There's nothing like there's no more sin. Sin is in the world. Sin was in the world. Sin is in the world. Okay. There is sin in the world. But for a man that is born of God, he has been delivered from sin. Sin as nature. The nature of sin does not abide in a believer. Whatsoever is born of God has the nature of righteousness. You can't have the nature of sin and the nature of righteousness. No, no, no. To be born again means your nature changed. You are no more a sinner. You are now a righteous man. But... There is sin in the world and because you're still putting on a mortal flesh that has not yet become immortal, this flesh sometimes can be overtaken with sin. But that doesn't still make you a sinner. It's just a righteous man who sinned. And in First John he says, my little children, this is right out unto you that you sin not. So it means you can sin. That you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Are we together here? So there is still sin in the world. And believers could be overtaken into sin. And those of you that might still have problems with that, you may want to go back and get my CDs again, my teaching on the believer and sin. I did a whole teaching series here in this house on the believer and sin. What happens when a believer sins? What is God's response? And um, what should the believer do and what should brethren do around the believer who has just been overtaken in sin? And what should the brother who sinned do? We have a whole teaching on that. Back to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So the Old Testament finds fault but the New Testament does not find fault. The New Testament only faith counts. In the Old Testament, it finds fault with the people to whom it has been given. Look at that Hebrews 8 verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, say of the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. God is the one who initiates it. I will write my laws. I will. He's the initiator. I will write my laws in their heart. And I will put my word in their minds. So God initiated it. Meaning all shall have my revelation. All shall know me means I will be revealed to all. All shall have my revelation. All shall know me. All shall have my revelation. And in verse 12, this is why they shall have my revelation. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. My attitude to their mistakes, my attitude to their sin, my attitude to their iniquity is I'm going to show them mercy. And because I will be merciful in their shortcoming and failures, they will not be afraid of me, they will know me. The only time where it is difficult for you to know God or know somebody is if that person is a terrorist to you. If that person is not merciful, if that person is not accommodating, it will be difficult for you to know him. But once somebody is accommodating and somebody is kind and somebody is merciful, it will be very easy for you to know him. That's why God says, you will know me and this is why. I will be merciful. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more does not mean memory loss. It means I will not hold them accountable. I will not hold them accountable. Because I already held my son accountable on their behalf. Glory to God. That's the charter of the New Testament. That is the charter. If you remove that from the New Testament, there's no difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament. The bedrock difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that verse of scripture. I will be merciful in the Old Testament, no mercy. 
their sins and iniquities i will not remember in the old testament there's a record that's the difference in the old testament you are punished for sin in the new testament jesus is punished on your behalf that's the difference that's the charter of the new testament that is what makes the new testament new testament remove forgiveness remove god be merciful and not holding you accountable for your sin. Remove that from the New Testament. The New Testament becomes the Old Testament. That's a chatter. That is actually the major difference between the Old and the New Testament. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So remission is the door to revelation. God remits our sins, forgives our sin, so we can know him. Sins can never allow men to know God's character. So in order for us to know God's character, he remits our sins and forgives our sins so we can know him. That's why in the Old Testament there's a contradiction to the character of God. Because sin was held accountable to people. People were punished for sin. So people could not understand the difference in God's character. But in the New Testament, since the punishment for sin has been put on Christ, our iniquities have been put on Christ, so we can now relate with God without sin and iniquity standing between us and God, meaning we can now have access into God and know God. But eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the hearts of men, but now it is revealed to us by the Spirit. Which Spirit? The Spirit of adoption. Which spirit? The spirit of his son, Kabayada. Which spirit? The spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That spirit, because we have that spirit, we have access to God. We now know the deep things of God. The spirit of revelation becomes easy among us when there is remission. When sin is no more held accountable. Where sin is held accountable, people can't really know God. And that's why in churches where sin and guilt and condemnation is preached, people can't know God in such churches. There's no way you will know God when you are riddled with guilt and condemnation, sin consciousness, unworthiness. You are riddled with shame and embarrassment. You know, that's what sin brings. Sin brings guilt, condemnation. It brings a sense of unworthiness. It makes you a coward. Sin makes you hide from yourself. Adam was hiding in the leaves and Adam, Adam was shouting, I'm naked. Why sin? But what the New Testament does is that all of that sin, guilt, condemnation, shame has been put on Christ. You are now accepted in the beloved. You now have boldness to stand before God without a sense of guilt, condemnation, inferiority complex, sin consciousness. You can now stand before God and call him Abba Father without cowardice, without shame, without guilt, without fear. That's what adoption has brought into our hearts. Why? Because your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. I'll remember them no more. I won't hold you accountable. So any church where sin consciousness is still preached and sin conscious songs are still sung, it will be difficult for those people to walk in the reality of sonship. Songs will have riddled with sin consciousness. I have made you too small in my eyes. So if you are the one that made why don't you make him big? Are you not the one who made him small? Make him big now. I have made you too small in my eyes. Oh Lord, forgive me. And now, oh Lord, I've seen my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my heart and with my son, oh Lord. How can he be magnified when you are totally full of guilt? Where is the magnification? The magnification of God is when you realize what Christ has done and you walk in the reality of it. How can he be magnified when you have downplayed what Christ has done? How can he be magnified when you have made the sacrifice of Christ a waste? How can he be magnified when you have told him he's a liar? He didn't really forgive you. He should forgive you now if he's serious. How can he be magnified? How can he be magnified? The Lord is only magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Hinga Madaga was the prosperity of his servant. His servants accepting what Christ has done. Sing conscious songs. And everybody will be feeling pious. He magnified who Lord. Hallelujah. He's magnified in the prosperity of his servants. Hallelujah. 
So the Old Testament looks for fault. The New Testament, all the sins and faults of everybody has been put on Christ. The New Covenant is a fulfillment of the Old. That means the Old and the New cannot work hand in hand. Because the New is a fulfillment of the Old. The Old is abolished. The Old vanishes away. The Old has been put away by the sacrifice of Christ. So if the old was good there will be no need for the new the new came because the old had finished serving his purpose and will no more be useful to the next to the next dispensation so he put away the old so the new can take effect you didn't hear that yes so you can't combine the two you can't hold the two together so the law expresses itself in finding faults the new testament doesn't find faults because all faults have been put on christ you cannot apply the two covenants you can't the old testament does not justify anybody the new testament justifies by the sacrifice of christ the old testament does not justify anybody the new testament justifies by the sacrifice of christ so in the new testament we have access to revelation knowledge because of jesus we have access to the knowledge of god because of jesus so in the process of our teaching we will discover that there are people that practice the new testament in the book of genesis and we'll find out in a short while second timothy 3 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness all scripture all scripture does not mean the epistles the epistles are not part of the scripture all scripture refers to the old testament the epistles are derived from the old testament and they draw their authority from the old testament so when paul was talking about the old testament books to brother philemon he said all the old testament books the scripture is given by inspiration the word inspiration is the greek word pneuma the breath of God, the inspiration. The word inspiration is the word pneuma, is the word breath or the word spirit. Pneuma, breath, spirit. All scripture is given by the breath, the spirit, the inspiration of God. That's why the scriptures are called the body of truth or the scriptures are called the canon. All scripture is given by the breath or by the spirit or by the inspiration of God. And the scriptures profit us number one for doctrine number two for reproof doctrine in the area of reproof doctrine in the area of correction doctrine in the area of instruction in righteousness so the scriptures therefore is the boundary of christian learning or the boundary of all learning concerning god meaning out of the scriptures you can never know god god is only revealed within the framework of the scriptures so therefore the epistles are drawn from the scriptures the epistles are not standing on their own they are not a standalone the epistles are drawn from the scriptures because the scriptures are jesus concealed the new testament is jesus revealed the revealed christ is taken out of the concealed christ is the same thing the revealed Christ is taken out of the concealed Christ. That's why all the epistles we are taken out of the scriptures as the rightly divided word of truth. The epistles are the rightly divided word of truth. Because the epistles is our family album. The epistle is the mirror of the believer. Because the epistle is Jesus revealed. And because it's revealed, we can look at him and see ourselves. We can look at the revealed Christ in the New Testament. And when we see him, in him, we see ourselves. It is rightly divided because in the epistles, you won't find any confusion about the character of God or the personality of God or any confusion about who the believer is, what the believer has, and what the believer can do. No confusion. It's clearly spelled out in the epistles as derived out of the canon or the scriptures or the old testament or jesus conceived so the epistles are rightly divided word of truth praise god 
The word scripture is the Greek word graphe. It means writing. So the Holy Spirit inspired people to record the things in the scripture or the things in the Holy Bible. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them i've corrected that before which was on them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that shall follow so the holy spirit in the old testament inspired the prophets to prophesy what did the holy spirit inspire the prophets to prophesy the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow so what is the summary of the prophecy of the prophets as inspired by the holy spirit in the old testament the summary is the sufferings of christ and the glory that shall follow so pay attention what is the partial revelation in the old testament the partial revelation will be in all of the stories the types the shadows the prophecies and the promises what makes it a portion of truth is the message in that portion that talks about the sufferings of christ and the glories that will follow any other thing is just story that's why it is portion the only part of exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy judges first and second samuel first and second kings and all the old testament major and minor prophets the only portion of their writings that is a portion of truth is whatever is in their writing that is the suffering of christ and the glory that follow either by types or shadows promises or prophecies character or story the only thing in it that makes it truth is that portion so what the epistles did now is the epistles went to all of the old testament and located all the portions of truth picked out all the portions of truth in the old testament all the portions put them together then in the gospels when jesus took up a body those portions of truth plus the appearance of christ in agreement forms the epistles that's why the epistles are called the rightly divided word of truth that's why for a man of god to be thorough in his teaching doctrinally he must be able to stay majorly in the epistles in the epistles not in the old testament the old testament just has portion portion which has been collated together and brought in as the rightly divided word in the epistles so the epistles have who you are in christ what you have in christ what christ can do through you that's what you find in the epistles the epistles reveals christ and who the believer is in christ so the climax of revelation is the revelation of jesus and the believer in him that's the climax of revelation that's the climax of revelation jesus revealed and the believer in him that's the climax the climax of revelation is not beware of delilah beware of delilah if not delilah will remove the seven locks of your hair she will shave you bald that's not the climax of revelation delilah cannot see the man in christ the man in christ and delilah cannot meet these are two different dispensations jezebel and the man in christ cannot connect these are two different dispensations zion agaba the man in christ is complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers second peter therefore chapter 1 verse 20 knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation the word private interpretation is not like private it actually means it's of individual origin no prophecy of the scripture is of individual origin interpretation there means source no prophecy of the scripture is of individual source if you want to understand it better look at the next verse 21 for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but the holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost 
So in 2 Peter 1 20, we're saying the same thing as 2 Timothy 3 16. All scripture is given by inspiration. For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Moved by who? The Holy Ghost. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. It's the same thing with holy men speak as they were moved. The movement of the spirit is what we call inspiration. The movement of the spirit is what we call inspiration. Hallelujah. So no prophecy of the scripture is apart. No prophecy of the scripture is apart. Meaning every prophecy of scripture is one. Did you hear that? Every prophecy of scripture is one. Whether it is in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or Samuel, or Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, or Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Zephaniah, all one. One prophecy. That's why it's called the prophecy. The, because it's one prophecy. One prophecy. All of them at different times, in different centuries, spoke by the move of the Spirit. And when their materials were collated, is one message. What message? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will fall. One message. Praise God. So, the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. There's a singular inspiration of the scriptures. There's a singular inspiration of the scriptures. So, let me use that to test if you understood all I've been saying. There's a singular inspiration of the scriptures. What's that singular inspiration? Huh? Just keep it yourself. What is that singular inspiration? Huh? Keep it yourself. What's the singular inspiration of the scriptures? Holy men speak by whether it was Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, who inspired them? Exactly. So the whole book is put together by who? Exactly. He inspired both the writings and he inspired the prophets who prophesied all scripture is given by the inspiration of god romans 16 24 the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all amen now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel which is the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began the revelation of what the revelation of what the mystery which was kept secret since the world began so what was kept secret since the world began the mystery the mystery oh okay so what was the message of paul the revelation of the mystery where is the mystery old testament where is the revelation new testament the revelation of the mystery the old testament was mystery the new testament is revelation the old testament is jesus concealed the new testament is jesus revealed revelation mystery so the old testament is mystery concealed the new testament is revelation so that's why before you understand the new testament you pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened now you may have the spirit of wisdom which is revelation in the knowledge of him but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting god made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to god only wise be glory through jesus christ forever amen is now made manifest hallelujah the secret that was hid since the world began is now made manifest where the revelation generation 
the secret is now made manifest meaning there is no more secret hello if something was a secret and somebody exposed it is it a secret anymore no more a secret no more a secret hallelujah pastor isaac come isaac come 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 put your two hands in your ears block your ears completely don't cheat completely let's look up to heaven somebody quietly say revelation say revelation don't tell him remove your hand what did we say you don't know so what we said is a secret to him is a mystery so right now all of us are mysterious we look like a mystery to him because he doesn't know what we have all said if we tell him to sit down and we don't tell him anything he's a barbarian where we're concerned in that matter it means all of us have a collective secret that he doesn't know okay okay go back to your seat we just said something you need revelation you need revelation is a secret but you need is a secret but you need so you can even be saying the secret without knowing the secret you didn't hear what i said it's a secret but you need revelation. <laughs> what does he need it's a secret but you need revelation is he saying it but does he know it that's what happened to the prophets of the old testament they were saying it but didn't know what they were saying what we said was revelation that's all we said it can be kept secret from him for the next 100 years unless the holy ghost reveals so many people are reading the bible understandest thou but you are reading you are reading but you don't know what you're reading until it is revealed that's why when they prophesied they were searching and seeking what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify they didn't know what they were saying and they didn't know the time unto whom it was revealed not unto themselves so the holy ghost told them even though you spoke it i won't reveal it to you it's not for you see you say something but you don't know what you're saying that's why it's a mystery unless it is revealed so that's why some people read the bible but they don't know what they say then suddenly you sit down in a service and i'm teaching the same place you read i open it and you go like wow what happened revelation you were reading you were hearing it was english but you didn't know what you were saying that's the power of god's word revelation knowledge makes the difference the greatest gift god gave to man is revelation glory to god somebody shout i receive revelation now when you read the writings of paul and you see the grace of our lord jesus be with you the b is never there he never prayed for the grace of the lord to be with them rather he informed them of the grace that was with them so it's always the grace of our lord jesus with you not b that's why everywhere you see the b is in italics remove it it wasn't a prayer it was informing them of what was with them for by grace are you so if you are saved by grace you already have grace so the grace that you already have is with you i'm informing you of what you already have so the more i inform you and the more you understand then that grace is made effective that's why grace and peace is multiplied the multiplication is in the knowledge of what you have already I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to do what build you up build you up in what area in the area of understanding build you up in the area of understanding so you're not a barbarian where what you carry is concerned so the scriptures of the prophets so that's what brother Paul said in Romans and brother Peter who says which the spirit did signify before time 
Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 will say, God at sundry times in diverse manners spake to the fathers by the prophets. Scriptures of the prophets testified before time. God at sundry times in diverse manners spake to the fathers by the prophets. So you see, it's all the same thing. He's saying the same thing using different words. Now, please listen very carefully. We have the summary of the Old Testament. What is the summary of the Old Testament? Sundry times, diverse manners. What is diverse manners? It means different revelations of the truth. Different revelations or partial revelations or portions of truth. Different revelations of the truth in the Old Testament. Meaning that the Old Testament is written in progressive revelation. So the prophets in the Old Testament were used by God to speak to the people. Progressive revelation. In Luke 24, 25, Jesus now calls them fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Which prophets? The prophets who spoke to the fathers. Spoke to the fathers in time past. What did the prophets speak to the fathers? The scriptures of the prophets. What did the prophets speak to the fathers? The spirit of Christ which was on them did signify when it testified before time what? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that you follow. That was the message of the prophets to the father. That was what Jesus called the disciples fools for not understanding what the prophets were communicating which was the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Meaning, the message is one. It's one. It was one message. There are no two messages. So, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things Kibayagama concerning himself how many message one message what's the message christ will suffer and out of the suffering glory will follow what is it called in summary the revelation of christ the things concerning himself he expounded to them in all in all in all in all in all the scriptures what is all the scriptures the law the prophets and the psalms the law the prophets and the psalms Shato Laba. the law the prophets and the psalms john 1 45 philip findeth nathaniel and says we have found him of whom moses in the law and the prophets did write what did they write jesus of nazareth Moses and all the prophets did write one thing. What were they writing and communicating at sundry times and in diverse manners? What were they communicating? Jesus of Nazareth. That's all they were communicating. There are no two messages. It's just one message. Whether it is preached from the law or preached from the prophets or preached from the Psalms, it will be one message. What will be the message? Jesus of Nazareth. The message is not David and Goliath. The message is not Samson and Delilah. The message is not Daniel in the lion's den. The message is not Isaac and Jacob. The message is not Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the lion's den. That's not the message. Whether it's the prophets or the psalms or the law what is the message jesus of nazareth and a man of god has no business standing on that pulpit if he cannot pull jesus out of the law the prophet and the psalms he has no business otherwise he will be wasting people's time in the name of christianity and that's what gives birth to religion and religious activities it's a form of godliness without power. In Romans, he calls the revelation of Jesus the prophetic scriptures. The prophetic scriptures. 
in Luke he calls it the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow so now we are moving from the medium to the communication itself that's what we're doing right now in this teaching we are moving from the medium to the communication itself we are moving from the prophets to their message we are moving from the Psalms to the message we are moving from Moses in the law to the message because it's not about the medium even though they have played their role but beyond the medium you must know the message you must know the message ladies and gentlemen it doesn't matter who stood on that pulpit to preach as long as he's preaching the message that's what matters whether he wear suit or wear t-shirt and jean meaning that it doesn't matter how a man appears it will be the same message if he has the message he has it don't be intimidated by the color of a man of God when he has finished appearing in the color wait for what will come out wait for the message we are going from medium to the message the communication what was God communicating through the prophets what was God communicating through the Psalms what was God communicating through the law Christ the sufferings of Christ and the glory that you follow that is why in Revelation 19 10 and I fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me see thou do it not I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit so all those prophets what were they prophesying the testimony of jesus the crux of any prophet's message should be christ it shouldn't be any anything else any prophet should be able to reveal christ if you can't read christ go and sit down you're a soothsayer you're a soothsayer you know soothsayers you're a diviner if you don't know diviners he's a sorcerer and in case you don't know he's a native doctor it doesn't matter how accurate his prophecies are if he cannot reveal jesus he's a native doctor rebranded even the old testament prophets had only one message christ when Jesus rose, he gave us prophets. Why? For the equipping of the saints. How do you equip saints? By revealing Christ. That's a message. That's a message. What of our evangelists? When he goes to crusade, one message. Christ. He preaches Christ. When an evangelist comes inside church, he teaches Christ. At crusade ground, he preaches Christ. In the church, he teaches Christ. That's why brother Paul will tell Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. You are not an evangelist, but when you go to the field, do the work of an evangelist. You are a pastor, but when you are in the crusade ground, do the work. Don't go to crusade and pastor people. Go to crusade ground and do the work of an evangelist. Then when you come inside church, do the work of a pastor. You teach the work. The message is Christ. Outside Christ, we have no message. Glory to God. Why is Jesus called the Word of God in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Why is he called the Word of God? Because the Word, Word of God is the Logos. L-O-G-O-S. The Logos of God. What is Logos? It means the thought. The thought, the reason for the statement. The thought before the Word. Jesus is God's thought before he spoke Jesus is God's reason for whatever he did so when God thought of creating man the reason in the mind of God for creating man is Jesus do you remember I did a teaching on what is man I did a teaching on what is man what was the conclusion Jesus is man and the man in him 
He is the man. He is the idea. He is the thought. He is the reason behind. Have you not read all things were made by him, for him? Made by him and made for him. He is the reason behind it all. All things were made by him. All things consist of him and exist by him. Without him, nothing will be. He's the reason behind. He is God's thinking pattern. Jesus is God's thinking pattern. That is what you see Jesus do is what God is thinking. He is God's thinking pattern. He is the thought, the idea, the reason behind whatever God does. That's the meaning of logos. He is the logos of God. Praise God. In the beginning was the reason. The reason was with God. The reason was God. So we do not study the Bible to meet needs. We are not studying the Bible to meet needs. We are studying the Bible to know God. We study to know him. When we know him, in his knowledge, our needs are met. Why do we study the Bible? To know him. That's what we study. Not to meet needs. Not to meet needs, but to know him fundamentally. It's called the word of God because it's the reason behind or the reason for the Bible. John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. So everything that was written of Jesus was predated. It was predated. Everything they wrote about Jesus was predated. It existed before it was written. It existed before it was written. <laughs> All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of man. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. He is God. He is God's thought pattern. Jesus is the mind of God revealed. Look at Revelation 19, 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called... What is the name? Who is the word of God? Jesus. In the beginning. And the word. And the word... Who is God? Who is God? Exactly. His name is the word of God. Zulatara. Zima Gengalaya. Somebody shout thank you Jesus. So we study the Bible to know the word. To know the word. The person. We study the Bible to know the person. We are not studying to memorize. We are studying to encounter a person. So when we look at the Holy Scriptures, it's able to make us wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine where? In Christ. Correction. Correction where? In Christ. Instruction. Instructions where? In Christ. So our doctrine in Christ. Our correction in Christ. So we cannot be corrected until we are in Christ. When we realize who we are in Christ, it corrects our mindset. When we discover who we are in Christ from the scripture, it instructs us in righteousness. So, doctrine is given to teach us. When we are taught, when it is explained to us who we are, in the light of Christ, we see who Christ is. In him, we see who we are. It corrects our mind. Then it instructs us in righteous living that's the vision of the scripture the scriptures are not given for you to locate which verses can i use to pray for husband which verses give me verses to pray for life partner the hottest one give me verses the one when i pray even if they charm my husband the charm will clear i need talisman because that's what they are looking for. Talisman. 
you shouldn't be looking for verses to use in praying for husband know christ in christ know yourself you will see your husband it's very easy know yourself in christ when you have seen who you are in christ you will see your husband you will see four five to select one you will see you don't know yourself that's why you think you can't have husband you don't when you know who you are you will know that there is no how you cannot have many husbands to choose one from you're not hearing me with men this is impossible but with god four to select one is possible with men it's impossible but with god four to select one don't be using all things right now we're doing self-application four to pick one and leave three for others zikano kamaha lego bode babara tabaya hile mono shakaya somebody hearing the sound of my voice whatever your desire is receive it right now receive 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 right now say i see myself in christ say in christ everything is possible i didn't hear your amen so when i read the bible how do i read the bible we read the bible in christ read the bible in christ that's why that guy the acts understanding that what thou did is when philip met that you know he didn't look for another scripture from where the man was reading he preached christ to him meaning anywhere anybody opens in the bible he should see christ there what are you talking about is the book not jesus's book the scriptures testify exactly anywhere if they like let them open one place in leviticus you know leviticus have you read leviticus before it's a very trying book so even if it's leviticus you are reading if you meet them there preach christ from there don't tell him no no leave leviticus come 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 let's go to acts <laughs> Philip didn't tell the man, no, no, leave Isaiah, leave Isaiah. Come to Matthew. Eh, eh. Beginning from where he was reading, he preached Christ. Kaya, that's a man that is conversant. That's a man that is acquainted. That's a man that is killed with the book. And every believer should be. Every believer should be. Amen. First Corinthians 2, 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind. It means we have the understanding. It means we have the interpretation. That is, our minds interpret the Bible in the light of Christ. We have a revelation of Christ. Meaning Christ is the explanation of all things. So we saw in Romans 15, 4, the scriptures are for our learning in Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the scripture is for our admonition in Christ. The prophets prophesied about Christ. The Bible classifies prophets of the Old Testament differently. Why? Because all of them testified of Christ. There are two prophets of the Old Testament that are quoted more than anybody else. Two of them. And the reason is because their books had a lot of Christ. Isaiah and David. I like David. A man after God's heart. Two of them, their books are full of Christ. That's why they are quoted more than anybody else. Isaiah and David. So that means Bible study must be in the light of Christ. It means Bible study should be to know Christ, to discover Christ. So the Old Testament prophets were classified not according to their miracles did you ever find any major miracle in isaiah eh? did you ever find any major miracle in david's book no but you will find heavy miracles in elijah kings kings elijah and elisha they were big boys in the miracle world but they are not quoted in the new testament nobody referred to them in the epistles that means they were small boys in the epistles which is 
the revelation of scripture nobody talked about elijah and elisha only james said elijah was a man of he didn't talk about his miracle he talked about his prayer just prayer he was a man of like passion but he prayed that it will not rain and it rained not then he said the effectual fathom prayer so means the subject matter that brought elijah to the mouth of james is prayer not miracle nobody talked about them the only people that were talked about all over the epistles is david and isaiah why the revelation of jesus so the greatness of a man in the kingdom of god is not by how many miracles he performs is by how much of jesus do you know give me matthew 11 11 verily verily i say unto you among them that are born of women there had not risen a greater than john the baptist notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he you know moses was a prophet i hope you know that moses was a prophet you know how many miracles moses did do you know how many miracles moses did he split the red sea land appeared in the body of water and people walked on top moses turned the entire water in israel to blood moses commanded frogs to fill the land so that everywhere where there was space frogs enter moses turned their water to blood you carry cup to drink water the whole cup is flies moses in action big boy man when magicians were trying moses moses said look at these guys he carried walking stick walking stick boom it became serpent then the serpent of moses opened mouth, bam and swallowed the egyptian serpent moses carried by the tail and put it down it became walking stick he said pharaoh let my people go power kabaya don't try moses so but john the baptist did not cure headache you know headache you know headache you're not hearing me you know headache john never cured headache yet john is greater than moses in the kingdom of god elijah let the god that answer it by fire boom, 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 boom. Fire. Ah, ah. Ella, Ella. <laughs> elijah is not as great as john elijah is not as great as john Elisha is not as great as John. Moses is not as great. Name them all the Old Testament prophets. Yet John didn't cure headache. There will be surprises in heaven. Look, the greatness of a man of God is not by the miracles he performs. It's by how much of Jesus he can reveal. So why was John greater than all of them? All of them said, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. John the Baptist is baptizing in River Jordan. He looks up and said, This is he. This is the Lord. All of them are saying, Thus, before me is the Lord. John saw the Lord. They prophesied. The man that sees the Lord is greater than those that prophesied. Then he now concluded the matter. Yet the least in the kingdom is greater than John. Again, they shall know me from the least to the greatest. The least in the kingdom is greater than John. Who is the least? Anyone. And it could be a little boy in Sunday school. The least in the kingdom. Why is the least greater than John? John saw. The prophets prophesied. For you, he lives inside you. Stand on your feet. Let's close this service. Turn to your neighbor say, Christ in me. The hope of glory. Tell your neighbor, that's the greatest achievement. What's the greatest achievement? Somebody shout, I house God. Where is God's house? Where is God's house? Where is God's house? Where is God's house? So listen, heaven is made for man. Man is made for God. Heaven is made for who? Heaven is not made for God. God doesn't need heaven. God was before heaven. In the beginning, God created, but God has been before, so he doesn't need heaven. God doesn't need heaven. Heaven does not accommodate God. 
heaven is for man heaven is for man heaven is kabaya god doesn't live in heaven so heaven is for man man is for god heaven is for man man so god lives in man man lives ephesians 4 10 i want you to read like a mass choir he that descended is the same also that ascended wait he ascended he went to heaven he went to heaven he went far above why is it that when jesus rose he went above all heavens where did he go he went to where god is god is not in heaven god is above heaven so who is in heaven man who is the man the man jesus heaven at last who told you heaven at first heaven at when heaven at first heaven at first not heaven at last heaven at last is a prayer of people who don't know christ those of us who know christ we don't make heaven at last we make heaven at, at first look at hebrews seven twenty six. for such a high priest became us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and made you know it's called heavens there are three heavens let me give you the last one psalm 113 verse 4 the lord is high above and his glory above who is our god who dwelleth next verse who to behold So if God ever comes to heaven, is humility. How many evidence did I give you? At the mouth of two, a word. That when God comes to heaven, what has he done? It is humility. So heaven is for man. Man is for, I will live in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my sons and daughters. Where is God? In me. Where am I? In heaven. Okay. Jesus and heaven, which is bigger. So if I put heaven here and I put Jesus here, which one will you choose? So your prayer is not heaven at last. So if Jesus is not in heaven, I don't want to go. Why will I go to heaven if Jesus is not there? Where Jesus is, that's where I want to be. And I have news for you. Where he is? So question, where is Jesus? So let me ask you a question. Jesus and heaven, who is in who? jesus and heaven who is inside who is jesus in heaven or is heaven in jesus are you sure heaven is where so let's prove it ephesians 1 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly where is heavenly so where is heaven where are you where is heaven where are you where is heaven where are you so by implication where are you you're in heaven so if you're in heaven is heaven at last a prayer point where are you exactly you are in christ in heaven i prophesy to the first one thousand of you whose amen will come like thunder i command you to manifest heaven on earth manifest heaven on earth manifest heaven in your business manifest heaven in your marriage manifest heaven in your career manifest heaven in your company manifest heaven in your place of work 
welcome back ladies and gentlemen welcome back i'm excited that we can you know enjoy enjoy the teaching of god's word and i'm excited that these lectures are building you up equipping you and challenging you to walk in the light of the finished work of christ tomorrow is sunday where will you be if you don't have a local church where you attend or where you used to attend you don't fit in anymore 